again. <laughs> That's right, you ghouls and freaks. I've been reanimated and I'm raring to go on another Halloween film show. So butter up some popcorn, turn down the lights, and we'll... I thought that storm was going to pass us by. Well, that's annoying. Anyways, uh... Yeah. Let's go. Poor little May has a lazy eye. She is made to wear an eye patch, which doesn't exactly ingratiate her amongst the other children. On her birthday, she is given a doll named Susie that her mother made. We jump ahead some years, and May is now a 20-something working in a vet clinic with Borat's producer and Polly, the slinky sexpot secretary who's always trying to flirt with her, played by the delightful Anna Ferris. She's still got that lazy eye, but her optometrist gives her a pair of glasses and contact lenses which are able to correct it. Outside of work, May leads a solitary, socially awkward life, sewing her own clothes at home and talking to Susie, her only friend. You've been my friend my whole life. When you see me... You always have, but I need a real friend. But one day she becomes infatuated with a young man named Adam who works at an auto body shop near her vet clinic. She particularly likes his hands and thinks they're just perfect. She makes a couple bumbling attempts to get his attention, but it's not until a random meeting at a laundromat that they get a chance to talk. I love your hands. I think that they're beautiful. I, I used to be a hand mom. I can see you doing that. I'm kidding, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. She seems to have his schedule nailed down pretty good because she's able to plan another random encounter with him. They agree to see each other again later that night and he spares no expense on a hot date eating chips and salsa in a broke down old truck. You don't think I'm weird? I do think you're weird. I like weird. I like weird a lot. He takes her over to see his place and, ooh, 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 you see that poster right there? Remember it. It might come up again later in the episode. You're on to me. I'm a psycho. Gotcha. I really like Jeremy Sisto's performance as Adam. He plays just the right note of being a little bit weirded out by May, but also very intrigued and is genuinely attracted to her. Adam agrees to another date with her, but this time at her place for some macaroni, cheese, and Gatorade. And you want so badly for May to not screw things up, but eventually she goes a bit too far for his liking, and Adam politely but firmly excuses himself from the situation. May, this is weird. You like weird. Not that weird. I told you to face the goddamn wall! May takes out her anger on Susie, who is beginning to crack along with her. She's hurt by Adam's rejection, and so May starts to give in to Polly's advances instead. She does really like her neck. But, unfortunately for May, she discovers that Polly kinda gets around and will take it from wherever she can get it. Look, I can kick her out if you really want me to. You know you're my main mama. And so things march toward the inevitable when May finally snaps and decides that she's gonna make herself a new friend. A perfect friend made up of only perfect parts if you see where it's heading here. And so on Halloween night, she sets off to collect those parts. I've only seen Angela Bettis in a couple of things, but I honestly can't imagine anyone else nailing the role of May as perfectly as she does. Until she goes full on psycho, your heart really breaks for this poor girl. And with each awkward and ill-advised step towards madness that she makes, you just wanna say, no, May, don't. Don't go over to his house again. Don't try calling him again. It's not gonna go well. I was just thinking that maybe we could get together and do Something. I have plans. Oh. Quiet! Hello? Who are you talking to? 
But when she finally does go over the edge, all of her gawky ticks and quirks seem to just vanish and she becomes poised, confident, terrifying. Spend some time with May this Halloween, but be careful. She might just take your heart. I need more parts. <laughs> opera, also known as Terror at the Opera, is another fine example of an Italian giallo film. We'll get more into that later. An opera company is staging a production of Macbeth by Verdi, originally composed in 1847. The star of the show is injured in a car accident on opening night, and so her young understudy Betty has to take on the role of Lady Macbeth. It is purported to be a cursed opera with many mishaps and tragedies plaguing its history on the stage. It's the opera. Macbeth brings bad luck. What are you talking about? Everyone says it. Macbeth brings bad luck. The show must go on, and that evening Betty makes her stage debut. During the performance, there is an unseen spectator lurking through the halls of the opera house, avoiding all the stage hands and house staff until they finally find an empty box to view the show. What are you doing here? You're not allowed in here. This box is for stage personnel only. Come on, let's go. The audience, musicians, and stage company are completely oblivious to the poor fool being murdered up in the spectator box, and so once they deal with the busted light, the show continues, receiving thunderous applause. After the performance, Betty gets all the kudos from her agent, her seamstress, her director, and this random opera enthusiast. Ah, oh, you're a fan of mine. Yes. The first. Betty goes off to celebrate privately with Stefano, her stage manager boyfriend, but someone else is in there with them. When Stefano leaves the room, she is bound and gagged by a masked, black-gloved assailant who also tapes a row of needles to her eyes, forcing her to watch whatever transpires. Take a good look. If you try to close your eyes, you'll tear them apart. So you'll just have to watch everything. When Stefano returns, he is quite brutally murdered in front of Betty. So the needles are supposed to prevent her from closing her eyes, but it's kind of funny because when you look closely, the needles are about a mile away from her eyes, but eh, details. And then the killer just lets her go. Once outside, she reports the murder to the police and then just happens to run into Marco, her director. He takes her home and she tells him what happened. The next day, an inspector named Santini arrives at the opera house to question the staff, and hey, that's that random dude from earlier. On top of Stefano's murder, a piece of Betty's wardrobe was found slashed the night before, as well as a few of the trained ravens that they use in the show. Julia, the seamstress, sets to work repairing the shredded garment and needs Betty around for a fitting once it's all mended. But our black-gloved mystery killer reappears and it's the same song and dance as before. Bound, gagged, needles under the eyes, and Betty is forced to watch as Julia is finished off. And then the killer just lets her go. Back at her apartment building, Betty runs into Santini, the inspector. Santini tells Betty to go upstairs, lock herself in, and wait for another detective that he's going to send right over to keep guard. The detective does come right over, and she's also joined by Mira, her agent. But then another man comes to the door, claiming to also be the detective sent by Santini. He's got the identification and the gun and everything. And this leads to one of the coolest shots in the film. A shot so cool that Quentin Tarantino paid homage to it in Kill Bill. <laughs> So in true Jallo fashion, the plot continues getting more and more ridiculous, particularly how the killer is revealed and who he is. You see, it's explained earlier that ravens have incredibly good memories and can recall people and events for years, and so they were witness to who attacked them and destroyed the costume after opening night. Marco devises a scheme where halfway through a performance, they'll let the ravens loose in the theater, and if the killer is in the audience, they'll find him. Oh boy. But you know, that kind of silliness is really what's fun about the genre. Getting back to Quentin Tarantino, on a recent episode of his Video Archives podcast he does with Roger Avery, they discuss what makes a giallo a giallo. He lists all the big tropes of the genre, and I just have to share it with you. Oh, let's go through the templates, yeah. okay? Well, so basically, they all start as big murder mysteries. You don't know who the killer is. Mm -hmm. 
they don't all have to have black gloves, but most of them have black gloves. Mm -hmm. You're introduced to a whole cast of characters, most of them which will turn out to be victims, but definitely suspicious characters that one will turn out to be the killer. How suspicious they are is almost comical. (laughs) Everybody could literally be the killer and everybody has reason to be the killer. The murder sequences, like like we were saying, are all like omen-like set pieces. Finally, there comes a resolution of why the killer is doing what the killer is doing, usually told by the killer as he's facing the last final girl or final guy. And it usually has something to do with their past. And it is so fucking preposterous. You cannot believe that this is the reason that the that that the whole movie is going on. And the crazier and the more preposterous, the better. Opera was directed by Dario Argento, who is at the forefront of Italian giallo filmmakers. He had an incredible run in the 70s and 80s with films like Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Four Flies on Grey Velvet, Deep Red, Suspiria, Inferno, Tenebrae, and Phenomena. Opera was made in 1987, and I think around that time is when we start to see a big decline in the quality of his work. I guess he can't stay sharp forever. But I'd still place Opera among his most enjoyable and viciously gory outings. Sure, adventures into the preposterous, but hey, welcome to the world of Jello films. Come on out and have a night at the opera. So, now I'm going to take you on a little history lesson. We're going to go back to the year 1922, where... Okay, that storm is getting awfully close. Uh, Shit. Well, damn it, this is the only night that we can shoot this. So, we're going to have to just keep going. Let's go. A creepy estate agent named Nock has received correspondence from a client who wishes to purchase property in their town. Nock enlists one of his employees, Thomas Hutter, to go meet with the client, complete all the necessary paperwork, and get a nice big commission for his trouble. The client is revealed to be a mysterious Count Orlock who lives in the Carpathian Mountains of Transylvania. Ha 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 So this hapless idiot couldn't be more thrilled with the prospect and races home to tell his wife Ellen. Hey babe, I must travel far, far away to the land of thieves and phantoms. Bye! <laughs> Leaving his wife in the care of some friends, Hutter sets off on his strange journey into unknown territory. He stops for the night and shacks up at a small inn along the way. He catches the attention of the patrons when he mentions his destination and Count Orlock's name. <laughs> Later in his room, he finds a cute little book that's all about the Nosferatu, the vampire. Ah ha 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 ha, poppycock. Hutter continues his journey by coach the following day, but as darkness falls, the driver informs him that this is as far as he'll go, leaving Hutter to carry on by foot. He completes his journey by way of a dark, spooky carriage that takes him through the mountain pass at an unnaturally fast speed with a ghoulish coach driver at the reins. They reach his destination, and at last we meet the bizarre Count Orlock, played by Max Schreck. And just take a look at this twisted fruit. Orlock goes over the contract for the estate sale while Hutter grabs a bite to eat. He slices his bread like a fucking moron and accidentally cuts himself on his thumb. <laughs> red flag! Red flag! Some other creepy shit occurs while in the castle. Hutter notices two small holes on his neck when he wakes up in the morning, but chalks it up to mosquitoes. God, what an idiot. The Count sleeps throughout the entire day and skulks around like a weirdo at night. While investigating the castle grounds during the day, Hutter discovers that Orlock slumbers in a coffin down in the basement. It looks cozy. Meanwhile, back at home, Ellen starts acting strange, waking up in the middle of the night as if in some sort of a trance. After signing the paperwork, Orlock loads up a stack of coffins filled with dirt and rats and makes his way to the sea for a journey to his newly purchased property, first by raft and then by schooner. Along the way, the entire crew of the ship begins to fall ill, one by one as Orlock feeds upon them under the cover of night. Hutter, meanwhile, escapes the Count's castle and races home to be with Ellen, just as the eerie ghost ship arrives at its port. After a quick investigation on board and fearing a possible outbreak of the plague, the local authorities order the townsfolk to quarantine themselves inside their homes. This gives Orlock an opportunity to sneak through the streets to his new house and fresh feeding grounds. Nosferatu was directed by acclaimed German filmmaker F.W. Murnau and released in 1922. And if you've done the math, that makes this year, 2022, the 100th anniversary of the film. Now, this whole time, you may have been thinking, hey... This story sounds an awful lot like the story of Dracula. Well, you're not wrong. 
This was actually the earliest film adaptation of Bram Stoker's 1897 novel. The only problem was, Murnau didn't have permission to do it. Now, to be fair, it's a much more stripped-down, streamlined telling of the story. It excises several side characters and events from the narrative, all the names have been changed, and the ending was altered considerably. Instead of driving a stake into the vampire's heart to kill him, he is instead tricked into ignoring the cock's crow at dawn by a supposed female sacrifice, thus catching him in the sunlight and killing his ugly old ass. No! No! The cock! Now that's all well and good, but the Bram Stoker estate wasn't having any of this nonsense. Stoker's widow sued the production for copyright infringement, and a court ruling ordered all copies of Nosferatu to be destroyed. Well, shit. Luckily though, life found a way, and several prints managed to survive through the years. Since then, the film has been lovingly restored and is regarded as one of the most influential of all time. Ground zero for the vampire horror film. Happy 100, buddy. Berlin, 1921. We open on a movie stage where we meet filmmaker F.W. Murnau, who's in the midst of shooting, you guessed it, Nosferatu. They're working on getting the final shots on the stage before moving the production to Czechoslovakia, much to the dismay of his producer, Alban Grau, played by Udo Kier. The reason for this move is to accommodate the bizarre working behavior of the actor Murnau has cast as the vampire, a man who nobody has met yet. So when we get there and start filming, Max Schreck will only appear to us in full makeup and costume. And furthermore, we will only film him at night. That's Eddie Izzard in the role of Gustav, the lead actor in the picture playing Hutter. Catherine McCormick plays Greta Schroeder, a theater actress who doesn't care for this new film acting BS, but Murnau is able to convince her to stay on board. A theatrical audience gives me life, while this thing merely takes it from me. It is the role that will make you great as an actress. Consider it a sacrifice for your heart. After travel by train and car and carriage, they arrive at an old castle to film Hutter's meeting with Orlock, and the crew gets their first glimpse of Max Schreck, played by Willem Dafoe. As shooting with Shrek goes on, it becomes very clear very quickly, at least to us, that Murnau has just gone out and found himself a real vampire to appear in his film. Damn it, mother! I really did cut my... Oh, go and check the generator. You did that intentionally. Calm down. Ah. Let's get to the light. Jesus Christ, get this shit. Come off me. Shrek! What is the matter with you? After taking out the cameraman, Wolf, Shrek is confronted by Murnau about breaking the agreement the two of them have. It's revealed that Murnau has offered Shrek the throat of his lead actress, Greta, in exchange for his performance. You will leave my people alone. Or else what? Don't think I can't harm you. Then even I don't know how I could harm myself. A new cameraman named Fritz is flown in to resume the photography of the film. Kerry Elways plays the part, and he hits the ground running as soon as he lands. Shut up. Wait for my signal. Grab those defense guns! Did you get the shot? Yes, sir. And the gate is clean. The gate's clean, sir. Some time later, Murnau reveals Shrek's true nature to Fritz and Albin while under the influence of Laudanum, a type of painkiller. He also tells of the grisly deal he's made for the life of Greta. What did you offer him in return? Everlasting life. And Greta. Murnau is played by John Malkovich, and he is swinging for the fences. I think it's safe to say that the real-life Murnau was nothing like the morally bankrupt character we see here. In this film, he's over-the-top, pretentious as all hell, incredibly self-absorbed, and will stop at nothing to create his film, even as the crew is dropping dead all around him. Frankly, Count, I find this composition unworkable. Could you return to your original mark, please? And do I even need to bother saying that Max Schreck was not actually a vampire either? Willem Dafoe has had a long career of playing villains, weirdos, scumbags, and hell, even Jesus Christ. But I think this is one of his standout roles thanks in no small part to the incredible makeup and wardrobe. Then of course they designed a makeup that was its quite extreme. And then I had this costume that really put restrictions on how I, I would move. I started really from a place of imitation, and then dealing with uh, all these external things to help me find a way of moving and a way of being. 
So if you've already seen Nosferatu, or even if you're checking it out for the first time, why not make it a double feature along with Shadow of the Vampire? It's a fun and spooky piece of historical fiction. You will stay away from my crew! I will finish my picture! <sighs> Uh, hell, while we're at it, why don't we make it a triple feature? Nosferatu was remade in 1979, shot simultaneously in both English and German versions. Nosferatu the Vampire and Nosferatu Phantom der Nacht, or Phantom of the Night. It was written, produced, and directed by the great prolific German filmmaker Werner Herzog. Younger audiences will probably recognize him from his small but pivotal role in the Star Wars series The Mandalorian. Although I acknowledge that bounty hunting is a complicated profession, this being the case, proof of termination is also acceptable for a lower fee. It had been over 50 years since the original Nosferatu film, and there had been many adaptations of the Dracula novel, done legitimately and much more faithfully. And by the time Herzog made this film, the book had become public domain, so he was free to do with it as he pleased. But instead, he skewered toward remaking the Murnau film rather than the Stoker novel. He did restore all the characters' original names, however, so Count Orlok is back to being Count Dracula, Hutter is now Jonathan Harker, Ellen is now Lucy, Nock is now Renfield, and so on. I'm not gonna run through the whole plot again because it is more or less identical, but what I will speak to is the absolutely haunting atmosphere that engulfs the entire film. The dark, ethereal music score was composed by longtime Herzog collaborators Popol Vu. They bring an eerie unworldliness to the picture and gives you an uneasy feeling that you can't quite place. Herzog takes particular care and time in building this mood, especially during the journey to Castle Dracula. And that is something 20th Century Fox never understood. They said, yeah, here, for example, yeah, that's enough here. Let's cut it here or let's cut it there because a film is going to go fast. So right. It was that simple. And, and they do not understand that sometimes in a movie, the landscape and the transition uh, is more important than, than the story right now and the speed of a story. A major distinction between Murnau's Nosferatu and Herzog's is their depiction of the Dracula character. In the original film, the Count doesn't really have much character or emotions and is more akin to an insect, if anything. He just kind of moves around creepily in a very stagey way, and God love him. But the Count, as written by Herzog and performed by Klaus Kinski, brings a deep level of pathos to the part that attempts to humanize this hideous creature, if only by a little. He just wants what humans want, which is something that he'll never have. Sterben ist Grausamkeit und Ahnungslosen, aber der Tod ist nicht alles. Es ist noch viel grausamer, nicht sterben zu können. Ich wünschte, ich könnte an der Liebe teilhaben, die zwischen Ihnen und Jonathan ist. This was Herzog's second picture with actor Klaus Kinski coming after his 1972 film Aguirre, The Wrath of God. The two would go on to make five films together in what is one of the most fruitful and volatile actor-director collaborations in film history. Uh, did you uh, pull a gun on Klaus? Well, there are some, some crazy reports about that. I must... <laughs> Kinski was notorious for throwing tantrums, screaming obscenities, breaking contracts, and being a general pestilence on set. It's hard to believe that this madman would endure four hours of makeup each morning to transform into the Count. But according to Herzog, no matter what agony goes into making a film, all that really matters is what ends up on the screen, and Kinski gives us one of the all-time great screen vampires. Bram Stoker's character of Dracula has been the subject of countless films, good and bad, for over a hundred years now, and there will certainly be more to come. But it's interesting that two of the most memorable were the very first one, which was illegally adapted, and a remake of that illegal adaptation. Let's hear it for Count Orlok. Okay, the skylight in my garage just broke and we've got to get the hell out of here. I'm Eugene and this is my Halloween film. 